Warning, clear your browser history after listening to this episode. The censorship police are out in force. Don't listen to this if you have any concerns about censorship or Big Brother having a look at what you're listening to because guess what? This episode is so inflammatory. It is banned from YouTube. Stay tuned and figure out why. Looking to shed a few of those COVID-19 pounds looking to get a little bit stronger and improve mental clarity, make sure that you're super dialed in at work and at home. Well, let me tell you, over the summer, the team here at Dave Moore PT has been building these programs out. So if you head to davemore.net slash training programs, you'll find one of my favorite programs called The Beast. This program is designed for the seasoned veteran, the dad, the grinder, making things happen at home, in their community, at work, but just need to ensure that their long-term health is looked after. This is an eight-week program that I built based off of my experience. It really focuses on ensuring that your metabolic health and your testosterone levels are optimized. So if that sounds like a good program, a good fit for you, head to davemoral.net slash training programs, find the beast. And on top of that, you get your first week absolutely free. And there is no commitment long-term cancel any time but i guarantee i guarantee that you are going to lose 10 pounds and additionally you're going to start dialing your life and feeling a whole hell of a lot better by the end of that eight weeks so if that sounds like a good deal for you head to davemore.net slash training programs and get on the beast today winter's coming folks you know what that means it means cold weather and vitamin d deficiency If you live anywhere north of, let's say, Connecticut, you know that this is usually a time of year where mm, spending a lot of time inside. Don't get that nice, hot, fresh sun on your chest nearly as much as you should, and that means vitamin D levels are inevitably going to go down. 70% of us, that's what happens. And you know what? When you have low vitamin D levels, that's not good for your health. study published in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, saw that those that had low vitamin D levels were two times more likely to contract COVID-19. Oh, shit. Okay, so how do you get really good, high-quality vitamin D? I got a solution. Head to onit.com slash moro and get yourself some vitamin D spray. I drink it. Kids drink it. Wife drinks it. Every day while you're there, why don't you pick up a kettlebell? Why don't you pick up some alpha brain? And make sure to drop Moro into the discount code area and get a nice little discount just for listening to the podcast. That's onit.com slash Moro. Get yourself sorted for the coming winter months. Welcome to the Hard to Kill podcast. The go-to podcast for military, LEO, and EMS professionals. Sharing ideas and experiences from around the world to make you hard to kill. Here's your host, Dave Morrow. Hey folks. So I'm trying something new and I'm going to be doing a bit more video content for not only the the podcast, but everything in general. Video is king right now. It's really crushing it. And uh, I got a nice new setup, as you can see. Um, the camera's set up. I'm good to go. And I figured what better way, what fitting topic would be COVID-19? What's on everybody's mind from coast to coast, country to country? And as you know, everything I do here is researched. Everything I do here is to improve your health. And as a community, I want the community to be as informed, and as healthy as humanly possible. If you listen to any of my previous recordings on this topic, I am constantly hammering home the point that we need to get healthy. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is evidence-based research. Getting yourself healthy not only will help you against COVID-19, but literally every other disease of modernity. Diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity. These are all the things that we need to get a grip of. And if you listen to my last podcast that I did with Dr. Philip Ovedia, he's literally talking about these things. He works in people's hearts. He works on 
fixing them after decades of abuse and just getting smashed by poor diet and health. And it's not because people aren't trying. It's because people have the wrong information, the wrong paradigm, the, the wrong blueprint to go by. So doctors like himself and all kinds of other awesome people out there are pumping out amazing content and saying, Hey, we got to pump the brakes here. Like things are going off the rails. All I'm trying to do is be a conduit. I'm not that researcher. I'm not that individual that is pumping out research. I'm the one reading the research. And through my scientific lens, from my brief training at university, I'm trying to convey that message to you as best as possible. And today's message is essentially all on COVID-19. And I want to present it as objectively as possible, just by stating the facts that are readily available from reputable sources so that you can start making your own judgment as to how to take control of your own health and not just listen to somebody and their best recommendations. You are in charge of you. You need to make the best decisions for you. So the title of this one is, are the COVID-19 lockdowns, procedures, policies, are they the single greatest global policy failure ever enacted? Yeah, I know. It's a big chunk of information to kind of swallow. And the title is, well, to be honest, it's pretty alarming. Now, I've taken the time over the last few weeks to kind of put together just a, a really brief and important snapshot of what I feel is the most important set of data and facts. And then I'm going to do a follow-up episode that is going to be more editorialized. So I'm going to, like I said, try to keep this as objective as possible. So I'm not coming up with my own conclusions right now. Um, and, and that's so that you can take some time, reflect, and actually go into the research, which is I'm going to put, put up here on the screen, but I'm also going to link it so that you can have a read for yourself. Because obviously, we're not going to read every paper. I mean, you don't have five hours to sit here and watch me talk to you, right? So I encourage you that once you're through this episode, go through the research and go through the links that are going to be posted on my site at davemorrow.net. Go to the podcast tab, and this will be up there. So everything here is going to be referenced. Okay, the, Nothing here is coming out of, of my head. This is literally from research from people that are a hell of a lot smarter than I am. So I wanted to preface that uh, with essentially uh, the idea of risk. And have we lost the ability to understand risk? Have we completely lost the plot when it comes to COVID-19? Let's go through some of the some of the documents here. And on the next episode, hopefully you can come to some sort of conclusion. <laughs> Excuse me, still dealing with a little bit of cold here, which is actually <laughs> relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, and basically start paying attention to things other than your regular news that is you know if it's you know the the cable news whatever it may be your your twitter feed whatever it may be if you're getting just regular news outlet stuff it's time to start broadening your 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 horizons your vision as to what is you know information that you're going to consume and i'm not saying just follow me i'm saying follow the people that i'm going to present here and i know if that's not something that you normally do, we're all busy. We've all got a ton of things on our plate to go start finding other sources of information and doing our own research. For a lot, that is daunting and not within your wheelhouse. If it is within your wheelhouse, though, I strongly recommend starting to look at these different types of information sources, which I've done my research, but always do your own research as well. Okay. Now, I'm only going to be picking things from credible researchers and journals, because I really respect the integrity of certain journals and scientists. And so I'm not going to be throwing out things that have no reference, that have no credibility, because I want to ensure that you get the best high quality information possible and that we we stay in that in that bracket of, hey, is this is this stuff that we're talking about here, is it actually reputable? Can we confirm it? And um, that's where we're going to start from. We're going to start from that 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 level of trust. Okay. 
So there's a few key things here, and I'm going to go um, in an order that I think is um, that is relevant. Now, this is something that I only found out about last week, and it's called the Great Barrington Declaration. Now, I'm sure many of you have probably never heard of this. And with respects to COVID-19, this is a pretty huge declaration. Um, I'm going to read what the Great Barrington Declaration is, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here for you guys as well, so you can peruse through it a little bit. Okay. So the Great Barrington Declaration. Now, this is a declaration that was signed in Great Barrington, which is a town in the States. I I don't know what state, but it was signed by, so far, almost a million human beings. The authors of this are very reputable scientists. And I'll just go to the, the actual authors of this declaration. So we have Dr. Martin Kuldorf. So he's a professor of medicine at Harvard University and biostatistician. Dr. Sunitra Gupta, who's a professor at Oxford University and epidemiologist with experience in immunology. And Dr. J, I'm going to murder this guy's name, Bhattacharya, professor at Stanford University Medical School and physician, epidemiologist, health economist, and public health policy expert. Okay, so these individuals have a really good pedigree. <laughs> they, they clearly come from the three most reputable, highest, the, the most regarded institutions of, of academia on the planet. And they came up with this declaration. And I'm not going to read it all, but I'm just going to read the, the very beginning parts so that you get an idea of what we're talking about here. So the Great Barrington Declaration. As infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, we have grave concerns about the changing physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies and recommend an approach we can uh, call focused protection. Coming from both the left and the right and around the world, we have devoted our careers to protecting people. Current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health. The results, to name a few, include lower childhood vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes, fewer cancer screenings, and deteriorating mental health, leading to greater excess mortality in years to come with the working class and younger members of society carrying the heaviest burden. Keeping students out of school is a grave injustice. Keeping these measures in place until a vaccine is available will cause irreparable damage with the underprivileged disproportionately harmed. Okay. So as you can tell, I'm recording this in early November, 2021. This was written in 2020 during the lockdown period, but before we had a a vaccine on the market. So what they're predicting is the actual remedy here is going to be a bit worse than the actual disease. So that, that, that's a very valid concern that you don't want to incur more harm with the actual cure itself. And that's something that doctors need to mitigate and, and keep in consideration all the time. Now, I want to just carry on here. Uh, as immunity builds in the population, the risk of infection to all, including the vul- vulnerable, falls. We know that all populations will eventually reach herd immunity, i.e. the point at which the rate of new infections is stable, and that this can be assisted but is not dependent upon a vaccine. Our goal should therefore be to minimize mortality and social harm until we reach herd immunity. Okay, so I'm going to tell you just a, a little anecdotal piece here uh, with respect to reducing harm and the potential risks of actually having a procedure done. And I'm going to use my back as an example. I waited for over a year, well, actually many years, to be honest, to go see a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon that, that works specifically on spines because of my disc herniations. And part of my goal was to get very strong and fit before I would even entertain surgery. So I finally got an appointment. It took a year to see this specialist. 
I go into his office. I have all my MRIs. I have all my health history. He sees me for literally 30 seconds. He goes, yeah, man, I'm not going to operate on you. And my world kind of got destabilized because I was going to give him this impassioned plea. I was he's saying, you know, I'm ready. I have been training hard. Like I, I need to fix this. My back has been a, such a pain in the ass, <laughs> not literally, but, and he said, no, no, I'm not going to, he, he goes, you're not even 40 years old. Clearly you're managing this. Well, you're strong. You're walking in here. No problem. The risk that comes with back surgery is far greater than what the benefit could be for you. And I was just kind of blown away and another two minutes passed. And, you know, he's like, you seem kind of stunned. I'm like, yeah, I am. I thought for sure I was going to need to get back surgery. He goes, yes. If you had it not taken care of yourself, you would have needed back surgery most likely. But again, you're super young. I don't see a need. Yes. You have bulging discs, but I don't see a need and you seem to be okay. So if it does get worse and you do rupture more severely, then maybe come back and see me. But until that time, keep on doing what you're doing. And that made me realize like, holy shit, that's true. If you take care of yourself, if you do the, the right things, a doctor is less likely to prescribe something or a surgeon is less likely to do something because the risk of surgery is very high. I mean, there is a chance of paralysis with back surgery. He was not willing to take that risk. The, 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 the ratio was off and that's from an expert. And so this, this, this parallel here is similar applying really radical social policies like lockdowns, like we're talking about um, mandates and stuff, do they produce more harm? Now, next episode, I'll go into kind of the, my thoughts and, and more editorialized, but here I just want to present the facts on this. So this is the Great Barrington Declaration. I'll have the link uh, posted for you in the show notes. And we can see here, the, there's a ton of co-signers and all, the ones they have on the site are all doctors. Okay. So that's one juicy bit of fact that you likely didn't know. And um, the next one we're going to look at is a really interesting uh, bit of research that was done at Simon Fraser uh, Institute. So this is uh, here in Canada. And uh, they're a think tank and they, they do a lot of good work here. Um, you know, they have a lot of very smart human beings doing the work, so to speak. And this is something that was published actually just a few days ago, uh, correction, uh, in April uh, 2021. I only became aware of it a few days ago. And the title of this is COVID Lockdown Cost Benefits, Cost Versus Benefits, a Critical Assessment of the Literature. And it's written by Douglas W. Allen. And let me just pull this up here so you can have a quick look. Okay. So we can see here, um, and I'm just going to take a look at the abstract because this is a very well-researched. There's over 80 citations in this paper uh, for this work. Additionally, the, the abstract really distills what the point of the paper is. And at the start of this podcast, I asked, is this the single greatest policy failure ever enacted? And in this case here, um, I'll just read through this quickly. So the abstract states that examination of over 80 COVID-19 studies reveals that many relied on assumptions that were false and which tended to overestimate the benefits and underestimate the costs of lockdowns. As a result, most of the early cost-benefit studies arrived at conclusions that were refuted later by data and which rendered their cost-benefit findings incorrect. So as you skip ahead here, generally speaking, the ineffectiveness of lockdowns stems from voluntary changes in behavior. And if we go all the way down, so using a cost-benefit method proposed by Professor Brian Kaplan and using two extreme assumptions of lockdown effectiveness, the cost-benefit ratio of, lock of lockdowns in Canada in terms of life years saved is between 3.6 to 282. That is, it is possible that lockdowns will go down as one of the greatest peacetime policy failures in Canada's history. Well, okay. Let me just explain what this 3.6 to 282 means. It's a ratio. So cost benefit ratio of lockdowns in Canada in terms of life years saved. 
So the cost versus the benefit, if you have a positive integer, so every number greater than one, that means the cost is greater than the benefit. So the baseline is 3.6 and it varies all the way to 282. So therefore the cost is significantly higher than the benefit according to Douglas W. Allen and the Fraser Institute, Simon Fraser Institute. Okay, so that's the second piece of, uh, of information that I'm dropping here. And again, the link will be posted and you can see here, I'm just gonna scroll through like this is, this is a beast of a paper. I think it's over 50 pages. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read it thoroughly, all 50 pages. I have gone through it, but I intend to go through a little bit more. And if you have any comments, questions, please feel free to drop them in the podcast episode comments section. I'd love to hear what they are. Again, I'm not an expert in this. Don't forget. And I don't imagine you are either, but even if you are, that'd be awesome. Hey, let's see what your, your thoughts and comments on here, because no matter what research is, is presented, there's always going to be holes in it. Okay. So let's keep that in mind. Next up. Let's see what we have with respects to the way we're thinking and the way that things are unfolding as a society. And this is something that troubles me and likely troubles you as well. Doesn't matter what side of the aisle you fall on. And this is what's great about this, this article. Now, this article is uh, written by Norman Deutsch. So he's a psychoanalyst, uh, psychiatrist. He's a MD. So he's got a, a lot of um, academic credentials. He's a professor, I believe, at the uh, University of Toronto, and um, he also works at Columbia University. Anyways, you get the picture. He's a smart guy. And he writes a really good recurring, if you want to call it blog article, I guess. Um, and it's all about COVID-19. And he's got some really interesting points because he comes at it from a very well-studied academic perspective of psychology. And I want to point out some of the things that he, he mentioned here. And, and one thing that I was not aware of uh, up until reading his article, and it's called the behavioral immune system. So if this is the first time you hear of it, cool. If not, good on you. You're a lot more well-informed than I am. So let me share the screen again. And let's look at what his article says. So there one reason, uh, so I'll read this paragraph here. Uh, and yet ever since they were made available, he's talking about vaccines, vaccines have been controversial and it has always been difficult to have uh, non-emotionally charged discussions about them. One reason is that in humans and other animals, any infection can trigger an archaic brain circuit in most of us called the behavioral immune system. It's a circuit that is triggered when we sense we may be near a potential carrier of disease causing disgust, fear, and avoidance. It is involuntary and not easy to shut off once it's been turned on. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that. I've never heard of that before. Um, so to carry on what he's, he's talking about here, the BIS, so behavioral immune system, is different. It evolved to prevent us from getting infected in the first place by making us hypersensitive to hygiene, hints of disease in other people, even signs that they are from another tribe. Since in ancient times, encounters with different tribes could wipe out one's own tribe with an infectious disease they carried. Often the foreign tribe had its own long history of exposure to pathogens, some of which it still carried, but to which it had developed immunity in some way. Wow. That's cool stuff. Okay. So he's making the argument that it doesn't matter what side you're on with respect to vaccines right now, whether you are hesitant or anti-vaccine or you're very pro-vaccine and believe everybody should get it. We're each having our own behavioral immune system response and we're disgusted with either side's position. And he's saying that's a bad thing. And if you carry on in the article here, which I'm, which I'm going to do, which is outstanding. If you're going to, out of the three that I've done so far, I would recommend looking at this one. 
right away because it's just outlining in a very objective way what's going on right now. He does bring up the fact that in the Toronto Star, there was a quote, and I'll read it to you here. So I have no empathy left for the willfully unvaccinated. Let them die. That's exemplifying his point. For somebody to say that, likely their BIS, their immune system, behavioral immune system, is firing. And as he states in the article, it's very hard once it's turned on to turn it off. So he calls it crystallization. And when you crystallize on one side or the other, it's very hard to uncrystallize yourself. Um, and, and, and one thing, one quote that I really want to point out here, so I'll scroll right to the bottom. And it's from uh, Rishi Manchanda. And we're talking about vaccine hesitancy. Here. So for many Vaccine hesitancy is not simply about the vaccines. It's about the absence of faith in the wider systems that brought us the vaccines. Public health moves at the speed of trust, notes physician and author Rishi Manchanda. So if we want our public system to function better, safer, swifter, in ways that that more effectively safeguard the lives and livelihoods of all citizens, it must be rooted not in coercion, but in confidence and not only among the majority. Now, I posted earlier on this week a quote, a quote about the majority and the tyranny of the majority. And in this article, he talks about uh, de Tocqueville and how the majority oftentimes is wrong. And in a democracy, that's the unfortunate paradox. A lot of times the minority has the better idea, the more progressive idea, but ultimately the majority wins. And what that can do is create a lot of resentment in the, in the, in the minority. And we're seeing it now. We're seeing a lot of resentment on the side that is hesitant, that does or is completely against the vaccine because you're crystallizing, as he says, these ideas because you're not allowing for the discussion to happen. And that's a really interesting point, and I think needs further discussion, and especially at the level where we're seeing here, where we have a, a, a very credible scientist and doctor bringing this up. It should be in the public sphere. Okay, so let's move on. And this is where I'm going to call this where the red lights on the proverbial or the metaphorical dashboard are flashing red for our society. This has to do with the actual consequences that are that we're seeing on the ground, and uh, the first one uh, has to do with a recent article that just got released by the British Medical Journal, and I want to bring it to your attention because it's not being highlighted in North America. It's out in the British Medical Journal, which is the premier medical journal in the UK, if not the world. It's not a rinky-dink publication. It's not a predatory journal. These are journals that have decades worth of credibility. And they they publish something here. It's It's not a study. It's an investigation. And they typically do this into certain topics. This one is specific to the research done at Pfizer for the vaccines. So the title of this is COVID-19, Researcher Blows the Whistle on Data Integrity Issues in Pfizer's Vaccine Trial. So I've read through this, and there are some interesting points being made here. And like I said, I'm going to reserve my judgment, and I'm just going to present you the facts as objectively as possible. In my next episode, I will editorialize this a bit more. But the concerns raised, I'm just going to read this here and I'll share this for you so you can see it as well. And if you're just listening to this, I, I strongly recommend you, you either head to YouTube, join my YouTube channel, smash the like button, or make sure that you um, get a chance to, to go to the website at daymore.net and uh, look at the show notes and then download the actual paper there. So let's get this up on the screen. and. These concern raise, uh, concerns raised were from an employee at the 
Pfizer, I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't say she was a subcontractor for Pfizer to look at the data and to project manage the rollout and the, the procedural aspects of the uh, vaccine trials. Okay. So in her 25 September email to the FDA, so uh, her name is, her last name is Jackson. Okay. So this is a, a, a former employee that worked for a company that uh, was called Ventavia. That was a subcontractor to do this research for Pfizer. And this is very common in the pharma world. So in her 25 September email to the FDA, Jackson wrote that Ventavia had enrolled more than 1000 participants at three sites. The full trial enrolled around 44,000 participants across 153 sites that were that included numerous commercial companies and academic centers. She then listed a dozen concerns she had witnessed, including participants placed in a hallway after injection and not being monitored by clinical staff, lack of timely follow-up of patients who experienced adverse events, protocol deviations not being reported, vaccines not being stored at proper temperatures, mislabeled laboratory specimens, and targeting of Ventavia staff for reporting these types of problems. So this is relevant to the Pfizer mRNA vaccine that most of us here in North America have received. This is in the British Medical Journal, and the link will be in the podcast show notes. Next, moving right along. We have in our, you know, local, uh, say in our local, our local, my local community, <laughs> Quebec. So it's the province I live in. There was a, I don't want to say decree, but a mandate that was uh, looming for all healthcare workers in the province to get a vaccine to be fully vaccinated by a certain date. Now, 93%, and this is according to the CBC, 93% of Quebec healthcare workers are fully vaccinated. That includes doctors, nurses, anybody that works in the healthcare field. But that still leaves almost 22,000 facing suspension because they have only had a single dose or are unvaccinated. They had an uh, until I believe it was last week to get the vaccine. And they were threatened with a loss of their license. They were threatened with basically not getting workman's, uh, not workman's compensation, but employment insurance. What happened today was the government walked it back. The government said, okay, you don't need a vaccine, but you need to do mandatory testing three times a week, which means no vaccine, which basically means, I guess, PCR testing. That was 22,000 of our best and brightest, those that have been working on the front lines since the start of this that said, either "Mm -mm, I'm not doing it. And from another a quote from another nurse said, I'm willing to get the vaccine, but I'm pregnant. And I have my concerns like any, you know, pregnant woman might have regarding putting something in their bodies that during pregnancy may have some side effects when they're perfectly healthy. I understand that. So the Quebec government walked this back and the reporting is today on November, I believe what today is November 3rd. Let me just confirm today's November 4th. So that's an interesting development because 22,000 healthcare workers out of the system, we already have a hard time managing what we have now. I don't think things would have been very good had we seen 22,000 healthcare workers leave. Next, and the last point, the last article or point of contention or when we're dealing with the flashing lights on the dashboard, I want to bring up is burnout at the professional level, at the level of teachers, nurses, uh, police officers, EMS professionals is getting bad. 
I'm just going to use a Global Mail article to exemplify that what's happening in the teacher world because I used to be a teacher. I was burnt out and I didn't have to deal with COVID. It is a grueling job that gets very little in terms of reward. And most teachers do it for the love of their children and to see them progress. And there's a there's almost like a martyrdom attitude there, which I'm not okay with. But because the 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 working conditions are so hard, it's so stressful, it ends up causing a lot of teachers to leave just on a regular year, not years where we have a global pandemic, which basically upended the entire profession. So I'll just share this so that you can see what the statistics look like. And they were comparing uh, teachers from British Columbia specifically uh, and elsewhere, but mainly in British Columbia. So during February, 2021, 80% of BC teachers, that's British Columbia, uh, teachers surveyed reported that their mental health was slightly or significantly worse compared to before the pandemic. Whereas 40% of teachers surveyed nationally in a separate study felt the same. Okay, well, we can't really judge the merits of the, of the two different surveys, really. But overall, we can see that there is a, a significant decrease in mental health. Two out of five BC teachers reported being more likely to leave their profession than before the pandemic. Okay, that's already pretty bad because before the pandemic, most teachers, so I believe it was close to 40% of new teachers left within the first three years. Now you're compounding this with two out of five BC teachers reported being more likely to leave their profession than before the pandemic. Again, that's another 40%. There's a lack, a notable lack of connection for teachers with students, families, and colleagues since the start of COVID-19. So that is a fact as well. We're not seeing each other. We're doing classes over Zoom. There is a human component to teaching that is intangible, that makes the job enjoyable. This is not happening. And therefore, we're seeing burnout. I can anecdotally say that police officers are experiencing burnout. I can anecdotally say that corrections officers, parole officers are experiencing burnout at rates I've never seen before. So what's going on? If these individuals that are meant to protect and safeguard and buttress our society are burning out in droves, what does that mean? So I think we've got a big body of evidence here that we definitely need to dig into a little bit more. And therefore, next episode, I'm going to look at all this evidence presented and make a few assumptions, assertions, some declarations that need to take place so that we can start moving forward and not collapse into a world of risk-averse, panicked, fear of dying society where we can actually embrace life and enjoy ourselves and not constantly live in fear. That's my wish. And ultimately, I want you to be as healthy as humanly possible. And clearly, we're seeing signs that even if you're not afflicted by COVID-19, your health is being significantly impacted. And therefore, as we see, the cost, the physical cost of this is significantly higher than the actual benefit. So stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you may have. It helps immensely. This is all done for free, folks. This is free content. And since it's free content, the only thing that keeps the lights on are subscriptions and comments. So please, if you're enjoying this content, hit a like button, hit subscribe, make sure to leave a comment, good or bad. And I want some honest feedback and I want to hear what you think about 
these facts that are just presented today, you can head to davemorrow.net and head to the podcast tab and comment on the article that is going to be accompanying this podcast. So thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. The fact that you're listening is very humbling and we're only growing from here. So keep on tuning in and make sure to share with your friends if you're enjoying this content and I'll catch you next time. Don't forget, train hard, fight easy. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You can find out more about training, nutrition, and mindset at davemorrow.net. Be sure to like us on Facebook and Instagram at PT. And don't forget, strong people are hard to kill.